came out of the hotel. It's a, it's a three minutes, is it two minutes or three minutes walk to the car park. My hands were frozen and I started feeling some pains because of the cold. We now, I discovered when we entered the car, I said, what's the temperature? They said two degrees. I said, ah, this is like living inside the fridge. <laughs> How do you survive here? And while we were here talking about it, we drove out and I saw a lady with short legs <laughs> and a shirt. And, and she was jogging, she was stand. She was having fun. I said, okay. When a man is trained, he can become anything. <laughs> See me with cardigan, shaking. Somebody is wearing short decker and shirt. Anybody can be anything. Some of you, you've not done anything for Jesus. It's not because you don't have the capacity. If you are trained and exposed to the few, you'll be amazed. What some of you can achieve in a year if your potentials are released, you'll be shocked that some of us may not be able to achieve in 10 years. It's there. The capacity is there. You just need to allow it find expression. You know, Paul, the apostle, was doing all he was doing. When he became an apostle, <laughs> he said, I labor more than all the apostles. He never walked with Jesus in the flesh, but he had a capacity that was bigger than all the apostles. 27 chapters of the New Testament, he wrote 14. Peter had to reference his writing and say the things Paul spoke about are uh, difficult. <laughs> Even what Jesus told them at the Last Supper, Paul picked it in heaven. He said, I, I deliver unto you that which I received. How that Christ on the night that he was betrayed. Oh God, you didn't meet him. How do you know? Dimensions that the young man entered into. You are now wondering, why didn't Jesus locate for when he was on earth? He had his time. Some of you, you've not started because this is your time. It's now you will receive your encounter. And it will not be late because what you will do, even those who have started 10 years ago, they will look at you and be inspired. Praise God. This morning, I want to show you kingdom cultures that makes for productivity. Kingdom cultures. I've laid the foundation. Now it's time to begin the actual equipping. Everything we did in the first two, three sessions is just to lay a foundation. Now I want to begin the equipping. So the teaching will take a different flavor. Glory to God. At least everybody here is aware that there are two parallel governments on the face of the earth designed to propagate the agenda of the devil. The earth, who are either under the influence of light or darkness. The devil is not fighting with God. There's no basis for that. Because he is sustained by God. He can't fight God. But the devil is fighting to possess what belongs to God, which is you and I, to fulfill his purpose. We understand that. So when we talk about two governments, we are not comparing the devil and God or putting them side by side. Praise God. So the whole idea behind equipping is to make you become more effective as an agent of God. And I told you, the last thing that will happen in the program of the last day is judgment. Because judgment is the last thing that will happen, you can't choose to be idle. If there was no judgment, you can say, oh, I'm born again. Let me just keep my salvation. But you see, Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven. Because your state at the end of time is determined by the kind of labor that you have put on the table. So if you have no service to God, you will be naked in eternity. Because there will be no treasures. That's why it's a must for every one of us to put our hands on the plow. Because in eternity, there are two kinds of judgment. There is a judgment to save or condemn, and there's a judgment to reward. Let's begin from Revelations 20 verse 11. Can we give my sister a cheer? 
Every time I look at her, my heart, I'm, I'm affected. <laughs> give, give her a cheer. Let her sit. <laughs> Celebrate her. <laughs> give this woman of God a cheer. Let her sit down. You can do that work sitting as well. In fact, you can face the screen. Sit this way so that you see what you are projecting. Give her a cheer. She's a soldier of Jesus. Can you put the laptop on your lap? Does that work? Or maybe you get her something. Get her a jacket. Or you can lower that. I think that can be regulated. Lower that. You can lower it. You can, no, no, you can lower that. You can lower that. The doctors are here. They may start talking about radiation. <laughs> I don't want to argue in a field that I'm not fast. Dr. Larry, Dr. Lakey. We, as we surrender to your intelligence. Is that convenient? Okay, yeah, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's good. So you can put that on her leg. Yeah, that works. Is that safe? Okay. <laughs> so give me Revelations 20. I just read three scriptures as we begin. Please hear me. Fight to have a place of service in the house of God. Fight for it. It will determine who you become in eternity. Never go to a place where God is doing something and just sit down as a spectator. Insist to have something to do. It's not just about glorifying God. It's about what you become in eternity. There are two kinds of judgment. There's a judgment unto salvation or condemnation and there's a judgment unto reward. It's not enough to get to heaven. It matters who you are in heaven. And this is what the Bible reveals to us. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I told you why. This is because no mortal can meet the righteous standard of God. There's only one being that qualifies. There's only one being that meets the standard of God. That is Jesus Christ. This is where all the other religions of the world will be surprised. They will discover that regardless of all they've done, in the eyes of God, they will not be righteous. You know, there are many religions today with funny ideologies. They say, if your good surpasses your evil, your good will save you. If I mix chemical and water, and the chemical is more, will you drink it? <laughs> it's either completely pure or it's not pure. And that's how God's standard works. Imagine somebody prepares cake for you and say, uh, sorry, we mixed a bit of it with cow dung. But it's, the quantity is little, just uh, it's inconsequential. Will you eat it? And then you think when you come to God because your good outweighs your evil. You know, when the, if in the New Testament, the Bible said there is no righteous. No, not one. Go and read the Old Testament and see some of the things they did. Some people live their whole lives fasting and praying, but when the standard of God is revealed, they say none of them is righteous. So God had to give them a promissory note that when Jesus comes, Jesus had to go to hell to preach to others. In 1 Peter 3, 19. And when he resurrected, he said he led captivity captive. So those who believed in God and put their faith in God, when Jesus appeared, Jesus went to speak to them. And when he resurrected, some of the prophets were seen in Jerusalem. So it was the works of Jesus that justified them. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way. If he said, I am a way, it means there are other ways. He said, I am the way. So when they believed in Jesus, they were looking forward to the Messiah, the one who will save the world. Now, when you get to the end of time, you will meet that judgment seat. And he said, the whole earth and heaven fled. No one was righteous enough to stand and meet the standard of that throne. If you go to verse 12, hear what he said. 
He said, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Judgment is about to begin. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. He said, and the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the book according to their works. So these are two judgments. There is the book of life, and there is the book of works. Go to the next verse. He said, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the dead and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. Go further. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So if you are, your name is not in the book of life, you are cast into the lake of fire. If your name is in the book of life, then your works are judged. So your works will not be judged except as you qualify not to be cast into the lake of fire. Because there's no point judging your works if you'll be cast into the lake of fire. So they begin with the book of life. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, this is what the Bible said. It said, this is the record. This is the book of compendiums. And this is the record that God has given us what? Eternal life. And he said, and this life is in his son. So this is where you get life from. You get life from the son. And if you get the life from the son, you are recorded. This life is in his son. Go further. He that had the son had life. He that had not the son had not life. So if you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. And if you don't have life, you can't be in the book of life. Because the book of life is for those who have life. And for you to have life, you must have the son because the life is in the son. Verse 13. He said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the son of God. So, how do you get life? By believing in Jesus. And when you receive life, you are documented in the record. That record is open on the last day. So, if you don't have life, your name is not there you'll be cast to the lake of fire. But him that have life will now be brought to another judgment, which is where the book of works are open. This is why you can't be idle. Now you have received life because you believe in Jesus. You now sit down. You will succeed in the first judgment, but you will fail in the second. The first judgment is based on the works of Christ because he was the one who passed the claims of divine justice. He said the wages of sin is death. And all men are guilty of sin. That's where we all died. When we were born, there was a documentation that we have come into life. The book of life would have been a product of death. But unfortunately, Adam sinned. So now that we are born, the moment we become guilty of sin, we died. Are you seeing the problem? The only way you can be brought back into the realm of life is when you accept Christ. So he said, the wages of sin is what? Dead. So everyone was dead. Only Christ came with the life of God and fulfilled the claims of divine justice. When he lived the perfect and sinless life, died on the cross and resurrected. When he resurrected, those who believe in him, he credited life to them. So they too now possess immortality. But that's not where the journey stops. On the strength of the works of Jesus, you are justified and given life. But for you to be rewarded, you must do your own works. This is why serving God becomes a must. This is why serving God is not something you do because it's convenient. It's something you do because you are fighting for a position for yourself in eternity. Because when you pass the white throne judgment from the book of life, you will now appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, hear what the Bible said. Hmm. You know, people don't think serving God and working in the house of God or for God is a must. They think it's a convenience. It's not. In fact, if you understand this, you will beg to serve. He said, Therefore, judge nothing before what? 
before it's time. Why is that so? Until the Lord come, who both will bring to what? Light, the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. That's some of the things he was sharing. That means your work is approved based on the heart posture with which it was done. So it's not just enough to do the work, it's to do it with the right heart. And he said, then shall every man have praise of God. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. Second Corinthians 5 10. He said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every man may receive the things done in his body according to that which he had done whether it be good or bad. So those who are saved, saved, who will not be cast into the lake of fire, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And when they appear there, their works will be judged. Their works will be judged. My works will be judged. Your works will be judged. Now, what if you don't have works? Then there will be no judgment. <laughs> Go to the bank. <laughs> Go and manage whatever is available. You know, <laughs> in the book of Revelation 22, the Bible said, the trees that will grow in the streets of Jerusalem, he said it will be for the healing of the nations. Some people will walk in lack in eternity. And imagine if you are in lack forever and ever. If you are in lack in London, you say, I have not gotten a job. I will get a job next week. And if you can't get a job, you go to school, learn a skill, get a certification. After one year, you get a job. What if you don't get in eternity? You will be there forever and ever. So if you are catching cold, you can't buy a jacket. You will be there like that. <laughs> and the danger is that you will not die. You will catch cold like that forever and ever. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> Praise God. Don't mind me, I'm just being hilarious, right? But these are serious matters. Praise God. These are very serious matters. He said, we will all appear. Now, because of this, one of the things that we are taught in the gospel is the need and the urgency for service. You know what Paul said concerning somebody? He said, Demas has forsaken me because he loved this present world. I showed you why many become weak and fall away. Iniquity, cares of life, deceitfulness of riches, love for the world, and persecution and warfare. This is why many are not serving God. But for those of us who are willing to serve God, we must understand that there's an urgency. In Colossians 4, 17, Paul wrote to a whole church and he drew the attention of one man who was taking service for granted. He said, say unto Archippus to take heed to the ministry that he has received from the Lord. Say unto him, this matter is not a matter to take for granted. You must take heed. It's something you must take serious. And this is why we have put the retreat together. So that you take service and your work for God serious. It is what we determine the quality and the essence of your existence. When we gave our hearts to Christ, we would have been taken to heaven. We are here because there is a work to be done. Isaiah 53 from verse 3 to verse 6 and then verse 8. Let me show you something. Why we are here. He said, or begin from verse 1. He said, who has believed our report? Unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He said, for he shall grow before him as a tender plant. These are the works of Jesus. Telling you the labors of Jesus. And as a root out of a dry ground, he had no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. So, Jesus lived a sacrificial life because he was doing the works that the master had given him. And the work affected him so much that the Bible said, when we see him, there's nothing for us to desire. 
That's the extent to which he gave himself to the assignment of the kingdom. And in verse 3, he said he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. This is to tell you some of the prices you pay if you want to serve God. A man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And he said, we hid as it were our faces from him. He was this, and we esteemed him not. In verse 4, he says, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In verse 5, he said, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes were healed. Why did he do all of that? Because verse 6 said, all we like sheep have gone astray. He needed to do this to satisfy the anger of God so that we can be restored. It's on this premise that Paul spoke in Romans 5 verse 8 that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now that we have been restored, there is a calling to continue the assignment. And in verse 8, you will see that call. He said he was taken out of prison and from judgment. He said, who shall declare his generation? It's not enough to believe the report. It's not enough to be born of God. He wants you to continue declaring that which he has done so that others can also be saved. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19, it said to which God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. So we were reconciled to him. Our sin washed away. And the next thing is that he gave unto all of us who are saved the word of reconciliation. That's the calling of service. And it's a calling for every believer. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. He gave unto us the word of reconciliation. So if you are serving God, it's time to serve more. And if you are not serving God, it's time to be recruited. And trust me, it's a huge sacrifice. It will never be easy. The work itself is hard. And secondly, the work comes with persecution and warfare. Jesus did it. The Bible said he was stricken, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. If you want to serve God, it's a labor. But that's the pattern that Jesus left for us. And that's the pattern we must all follow. This is why we qualify to receive rewards in eternity. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10, he said, God is not unrighteous to forget our labor and works of love. It's a labor. It's a work. It's not easy. If there's any pain that is greater than the pain of childbirth, it's the pain of serving God. You will reject your family. It's not even them that will reject you. <laughs> he said, if you are my disciple, you will leave your father, your mother, your husband, your wife, your children, your land, your property. He said, that's when you can follow me. So it comes with a lot of pain. But eternity makes it worth it. Now, to be effective in this service, there's a disposition that you must assume. And these are some of the cultures that I want to share with you this morning. Just nine of them, and I'll be very fast. If you sustain this culture, you will be productive and your work will be accepted. Because it's possible to work and it's not accepted. It's a having received a kingdom that cannot be moved. Hebrews 12, 28. It's a let us serve God with reverence and, and what? Let us receive grace to serve God with what? Reverence. He said, for our God is a consuming fire. For your work to be acceptable, there are standards. And the apostles taught those standards as a culture. So that everybody who is a laborer will imbibe it. In fact, those who don't imbibe this culture, they gave a commandment that they should be rejected. <laughs> Let me show you so that you know how tough these things are. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Hear what Paul said. There are certain things that are hard is when you are dealing with disciples. He said, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the traditions which you have received from us. There's a way of life. He said, withdraw yourself from them in the name of Jesus. How can you be telling people in the name of Jesus to leave their brethren. Because if you follow them, they will, they will afflict you with their lukewarmness, their bad heart posture, and you too will become unfruitful. 
And if you don't withdraw from them now, you will weep in eternity that you did it. So he said, in the name of Jesus, we command you. There's a culture, there's a code, there's a tradition. That's what determines and defines who we are. And it's on the strength of that that we are productive. Second Thessalonians 3.14 reiterated. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. If he's ashamed, he will recover quickly and find his step so that he will be relevant with God. You must be relevant in God's agenda. See, our Christianity today is a Christianity that uses God. When people come, they are looking for healing. They are looking for breakthrough. They are looking for prosperity. The moment they get it, they disappear. And they think they are smart. In eternity, all of us will appear. <laughs> we will all appear before the judgment seat. They say all of us will appear. But blessed is the man that stays, carries his cross, and follows him. So there's a culture. There's a code. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.15 Write these scriptures down. Study them so that you can improve your Christian life. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by words or by episodes. Stand fast. Hold them. It's something you are deliberate about. It's something you are definite about because it will define who you are in God. There are nine of them I have isolated from scriptures. And I want to give them to you quickly. If you will be productive in kingdom service, and if you will be relevant with God in his agenda, and if you will qualify for eternal reward, you must hold fast to these truths. Number one is the culture of prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, the Bible says, Pray without ceasing. I'm telling you why many people struggle with serving God. I'm telling you why many people are not productive in kingdom business. You give them the least assignment they come with complaints. It's because there is no spiritual energy. And that energy is generated on the altar of prayer. There is no enthusiasm. There is no passion. There is no inspiration. So they cannot just know how to go about it. But a man who prays is not just passionate about the things of God. There are a thousand and one inspiration on how to get it done. So he, you will hardly find him come up with excuses. See, the problem many people have is a problem of prayerlessness. You know what the apostle said? When Jesus handed over the assignment of kingdom advancement to them, they looked at themselves and knew this thing, we cannot do it on our own. So in Acts 6, 4, they said, it's not meat for us to give ourselves to tables. He said, we'll give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the world. They didn't say we will pray. You pray when you have a timetable of praying or when needs occasion prayer. But when you give yourself to prayer, it means prayer is your life. Because they know if they will be effective and productive, prayer is non-negotiable. We will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the world. In Acts 2.42, the Bible said, and they continued steadfastly. This is not something they did casually. It's something they did with all enthusiasm in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. See, this thing defined them. Today, if you tell people, let's pray every day for one hour, they will look at you like, are you sick? Do you think that is sustainable? They can go to work every day for six hours. It's sustainable. They can watch movies every day for three hours. It's sustainable. But prayer every day for one hour is not sustainable. Because they don't know that they cannot serve God without prayers. You generate your passion from the altar. You generate your enthusiasm from the altar. You generate your stamina from the altar. You generate inspirations from the altar. When the altar is taken away, you become unproductive in the things of God. The apostles knew it. In fact, 
Others are sustained when you pray. Not just sustained by prayer, you also sustain others by your prayer. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 19, he said, My little children, of whom I travail again in prayers, until Christ be formed in you. My little children. Is that there? 419. Help me. My, in Colossians 412, Paul was talking about another brother who had caught the fire, who had understood the, the tradition. He said, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ. This is one who is in service. What made him a servant of Christ? He said, laboring fervently, not casual prayers, fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. This is a travail. If you saw the scripture we just read now, you saw that Paul compared it with the same travail a woman goes through when she gives birth. I travail again. If you see it in the Amplifier, it says, as in childbirth, so that Christ can be formed in you. Listen, if you want to serve God, the culture of prayer must become a must. It's not a start alone. So when there's a company praying, associate yourself. You are trying to catch it. You are trying to activate the dynamo. And a day will come when it is activated on your own. You can now generate energy. So you embrace it corporately and then you build capacity to do it individually. When you know this, you become a viable weapon in the hands of God. In fact, some of these guys made it a law. Samuel said in 1 Samuel 12, 23, he said, God forbid, I will not sin against God by not praying for you. He considered it a sin not to pray. He considered it a sin not to intercede for the church. This is how we become productive. When you find people struggling to serve God, when you find the work of God not productive, prayer is lacking. The whole administration, the whole structure rests on prayer. If there's no prayer there, nothing will work. This, many people just want to appear and they are moving in the prophetic, moving in the healing anointing. God gives them influence. They are talking to kings and talking to nations. It doesn't begin there. It begins from the cave. The reward of prayer is that God will make you productive. So that everything you lay your hands to do is productive. And you know the way God thinks? God is not just thinking kingdom is when you win souls. No. Your job is kingdom. Because the resources you get from there, you use it to advance kingdom. So, the same way you are prospering in soul winning, that's how you begin to prosper on your job. Suddenly you find unprecedented favor upon your life. Three times in a year, they are looking for who to send for a course. Your name keeps appearing. They want to give bonuses. Your name is appearing. They are recommending people for promotion. You are the one. Suddenly, everything about your life begins to work because there's an engine room of prayer making it happen. There's a dimension of favor that only prayer can produce. When Esther wanted to talk to the king, she was a queen, quite all right. But the time she wanted to go there was against protocol. But she knew something that breaks protocols. In Esther chapter 4 verse 16, he said, take a three days fast and pray for me. Beauty. I know there's something greater than status. I'm a queen. But if I go there when it is not allowed, I will pray for me. Your prayer will produce something beyond all I already possess. And if you study verse 5, chapter 5, from verse 1 to 2, as Esther was walking towards the king, the king lifted up his scepter and gave her a sign, come. If he did it like this, <laughs> they would have arrested and beheaded her. So when the hand went up, the heart began to pant. But prayer made the king to do like this. And she came forward. And the king said, what do you want? I have not even asked anything. Before she answered, he said, it will be given to you. If the king was in his normal senses, he would have stopped there. Because the word of the king came forth to the ground. The king now went further. And said, even if it is half of my kingdom, no king talks like that unless he's under a spell. <laughs> but you see, 
the prayer had put something on Esther. The Bible says Esther obtained favor in the eyes of the king. Before she came with beauty. Now she came with favor in addition to beauty. Where did he come from? He came from the altar. And Esther told the king what she wanted and it was done immediately. Listen, you will not struggle with kingdom business if prayer becomes your lifestyle. The third world war will start then. You are five, you can't agree. You are saying we will take over Europe. We will take over Europe. <laughs> if you become 100 or 50, what will happen? So God will not act daily except as the singleness of heart. So one of the culture that binds us together as an apostolic people is the culture of love. And this love is so deep that sometimes you can just look at a brother or a sister. You discern that this person has a challenge. You just come and dash the person some money. Hi hey sister, how you doing? Please, God bless you. heart is connected. You can tell that she's looking for what to eat tomorrow. You can just tell. You know it. It's on this note that Barnabas sold his land and brought the money to the apostles. He said, there are too many people I'm seeing here who don't have food. Share it. And Anani has thought, ah, they praised this man. He is thinking it's about clapping hands. And he went and sold his own land. He the chunk of the money and said, uh, I want to do what Barnabas did. Uh, Peter said, do you think uh, this thing is about the applause? It's not about the applause, it's about love. About church. When they say tomorrow is fellowship, be happy. Because you are going to see somebody. Because you are going to talk to a brother. You are going to talk to a sister. When service is over, talk to one or two people. How are you doing, my brother? It's good to see you. How is work? And if there's a challenge, don't just say fine as a cliche. Well, we have a little challenge, but we are praying. Can I share with you? Yes. We disarmament anyway. <laughs> because some people, if you just say you have a problem, the next day they'll say, do you? Are you aware of uh... <laughs> We need to grow. Ah, did you hear what? Are you aware that, uh, that, uh -huh, yes, you, okay, you know. Hi, my God, this word. This word. So God will help us. God will gossiping about things they should intercede for. Because there's no love. And those are the same people saying revival is coming. And when they are praying, they are praying like this. And the angels are looking at them. Full revival. You are 35. 20 people are keeping malice. You want God to give you this nation. Do you know how many people are here? And then we are so excited about the emotionality. You now come online. You see people pray like this. Do we know all forms of caricature? And the more we pray, the only award is that we sweat. And we record our sweat. People see it and say we are prayer warriors. And then we now take the posture of prayer warriors. When somebody holds the mic, he holds it like Zion. <laughs> or as he's praying, he moves like this. When you finish acting that movie, come back. What is in your heart? What's happening here? This is what they are reading. They are not reading the volume of your voice. That guy will finish praying and gossip somebody. And as he's here praying, he's keeping malice with somebody else. And if the Holy Ghost makes the mistake to tell the pastor, tell that person to back him. Two of them will pray and face different directions because they are quarreling. And we are talking revival. <laughs> there must be the culture of honor and there must be the culture of love. The Bible says if your brother has an ought against you, he didn't say you have against him. He said, leave your sacrifice. Don't take it there to be a waste. Go and look for him and make peace. And if you try to make peace and it doesn't work, he said, tell one or two people. Let them go. If it doesn't work, tell the church. That's the level. He said, if your brother offends you, forgive him. Peter now say, how many times in a day? He said, 70 times, seven times. He 
in one day. So what if you have 10 brothers? <laughs> Does it make sense? Your heart must be deeply rooted in love. It's a culture of the apostolic community. Then you have the culture of service. Everybody is actively involved in service. Service is not for some, it's for all of us. This is our father's house. We are not visitors, we are not guests. This is home. So when you come, you play your part. And if somebody else is not playing his part, you don't need to be invited. You ask for the opportunity to do it. That's how we think. I was in a place recently. I came as a friend of the minister in charge. And they had everything in order. But when he prayed for the sick and they wanted to take testimony, I saw that nobody was on ground. I jumped at it. Thank God I now have my opportunity. And I was taking the testimonies with joy. With joy. There's no pride of coming to say, hey, you came as a minister. But are you ministry of minister on to who? <laughs> if you can preach, you can sweep. And if you cannot sweep, you can't preach. So everybody should be willing to do everything. The guy in the bathroom is not there because he doesn't have a master's. You who is on the altar here, if there's a vacancy there, if there are too many people here, you can relocate them. It's the heart of service. We are all equal in service. And it's a mindset we must sustain. John 5, 36, see the way Jesus puts it. Just to help you see how Jesus thinks. He called service his witness before God. His witness before God is service. He said, but I have greater witness than John. He said, for the works which the Father has given to me to finish. He said, they bear witness of me. So Jesus considered his service to God as his witness before God. And it's not just something he does once in a while. He said, it's a work that he must finish. So I'm not doing it today because I'm available. I must make myself available. The work that the Father has given to me to finish. I'm telling you how men become great. Paul even considered it a spiritual thing. Romans 1.9 I thank my God whom I serve with my spirit. So it's not something you are just doing because you are available or competent. You consider it as a worship and devotion to God. Because worship is not just singing. Arranging the chair before the service is worship. All of it sums up to honoring the Lord and receiving His Spirit. But some people don't know it. You see, arrange chairs. They just come to do things anyhow they want. And when they are singing a song that is emotional to them, they are crying. And they are living. They don't know that that act of lifting hands is equal in the eyes of God with when they arrange chairs for people to sit and hear the word. You must understand how God thinks. To mop the floor is worship. If it is done for God to be glorified. Ah, this young man is trying to alter the balance here. You know that song? Help us. Thank you, Ari, for you. Let me show 
God becomes a byproduct. And if you want to host God's power on a daily basis, this is what you think and this is how you live. When you see people come out and they are demonstrating God, there are things they know. They form part of their consecration. The sick can be healed now. Impartations can happen now. Not because we had a high service, but truth is communicated and the hearts of men open. Some of you are already responding. It moves the hand of God. The last culture is the culture of thanksgiving. This one is the key for increase. Acts 2, 46 and 47. That's, that's, that's about my last scripture. Maybe with this and one more. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as to be saved. As they were praising God, they began having favor with all people. That favor now translated to daily increase. Daily increase. Jeremiah 30 verse 19. He said, out of them shall proceed the voice of thanksgiving and the sound of melody. And he said, I will increase them. They shall not be small. I will multiply them. They shall not be few. When you uphold these cultures, you will see that you too will host the power of God. The power of God is not for apostles. It's not for prophets. It's not for evangelists. It's not for pastors. It's not for teachers. It's for every believer. Even and on earth has been given to me. You go in that power. Every one of us here can walk in terrific dimensions of the supernatural if we know the ways of the spirit these are the ways of the spirit this is what makes every one of us an impregnable fortress and this is what makes us corporately to be able to across agenda regardless of the territory where we find ourselves can you lift your hands toward heaven i don't know what you heard but i want god to lay his hands on a few of you because for some of you this teaching this morning is a kind of recruitment into kingdom service. And Paul calls it the army of God. He said, as a good soldier of Christ. That's how he sees it. He said, no man that worried entangled himself with civilian affairs. He said, but as a good soldier of Christ, he give himself to it so that he can please his master who has called him. For some of you, it's a call. For some of you, it's a summer. For some of you, it's a recruitment exercise to come into the armies of Zion. Mm. Father. 